Hello, everyone. Welcome. Oh. We're waiting for Julia to join us. So, Julia, if you're here, I just need you to un. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Ah. So, <laughs> we figured it out. Um, oh, God. Yes. Um, so, I'm just so glad you're here and um, we love your film. Um, if you haven't seen her film yet, it's Angie Lost Girls. I definitely suggest that you check it out. It is playing um, very soon, actually, I believe in theater one at 6 p.m. So please head over there after this Q&A and definitely see this film. Um, Julia, can you tell tell our audience about some of the themes of this film and why this film was important for you to make? Sure. Yes, this film was a, a real labor of love project for me because I, I, a few years ago, I was volunteering in a children's shelter down the, in the valley. And I noticed how traumatized some of these kids were. And a lot of them had, had run away from home. And I, as I started more uh, from some of the other volunteers here and learning about their stories, I found out that a lot of them have been trafficked. Mm. And it, hearing the stories of the abuse that these 14, 15 year old girls had been through really shook me to the core because they were so sweet and naive and, and, and you could see like how you know closed off they were in terms of the body language and just you know very much like looking down and you you could you could really sense that before I knew what had happened I could really sense that some really bad trauma had happened to them. And I just thought about, you know, my half sisters or the young girls that I know. And I, I just, the, the idea of people doing that to a young woman, especially like a teenage girl who's still just really still a child and just growing up. I, I, I found it just so appalling and I became determined to do something about it. And I also felt like a little called to do something about it because around about that time, I kept meeting people working in the area, like various people from NGOs. I met Kim Biddle from Saving Innocence. And so I learned a lot more about child trafficking and how that kind of works in the U.S. from her. She introduced me to Lieutenant um, Andre Dawson, who was the former head of the trafficking unit here in Los Angeles. And so he was actually one of my main consultants on the film. I went to a variety of events. I had another um, <clears throat> actress friend who has a nonprofit that fights against trafficking too. So she invited me to an event that she was putting on. And I, I went to a survivors conference and, and I just heard all these stories that just really impacted me. So based on that, I ended up with, um, Janet Adogwu, who's a wonderful writer originally from Nigeria, mm. and we um, came up with a with a with a with a script together. I came up with the original concept, and Janet wrote it with me. And um, it, we just put this put this film together. It was a real labor of love project, as you can imagine. Films about child trafficking are not easy to get funding for. So we made this through the nonprofit. Everybody worked on it, you know, really as like a labor of love project. And it, it to me, so important to get more education and awareness around this with teenagers and families, because it goes on all across America. And even now in a, the pandemic, Traffickers are still finding ways to get into our homes. They're targeting people on the internet through various like games platforms, on social media platforms. And they, they're very clever. They know how to like worm their way in with um, vulnerable teenagers. So 
I, I really recommend to all the parents out there to really build trust with your children. So if they get like odd messages or odd approaches from people that they don't really know, they let you know about it. You know, pre-COVID and again after COVID, that, that I'm sure the tech traffickers will still use these techniques, but the recruiters are often another young boy or another young girl around their age. So they, they often don't seem like threatening people as you'll see in my film, and the woman who's the main trafficker, um, played by the wonderful Denise Nicholson, who is floating around, I believe, in one of the rooms out here, is um, amazing. And, and, and she doesn't look like a trafficker, because that is just it. These traffickers don't look like you'd expect them to look. They come in all shapes and sizes, there was one trafficker who, who was a, one of the very big traffickers who looked, was like an 80-year-old Chinese grandmother. Um, so that they come from like all ethnicities, all types, women, men, um, and often are difficult to spot because they seem very normal. It's almost like they have psychological training to know how to spot someone vulnerable, they'll target a young girl um, or, and, or young boys also get trafficked as well. It's not just the girls. She's a little left out, um, often on her own. They'll hang, send their young recruiters to hang out in places where the youth hang out, so places near schools, and they'll you know, work and wait until they see someone who seems vulnerable, and then they'll find a way to worm their way in, befriend them, and they will then gradually separate them you know, from their families, other friends, until they've got to such a point where they can get them to come somewhere with them. And then they're gone. And detectives work very hard. The, you know, I know the, the police in general have, have um, had a bit of a bad rap um, but I have to say, all the detectives, and I've met a number of them working on the human trafficking divisions here in LA, have been incredibly dedicated individuals who really care about this issue and really go to extra lengths to try and do everything that they can to get these missing children back. Now, I have a I, oh, <laughs> go ahead, Adam. I was just say it sounds. I was going to ask you a little bit about what research you've done, but it sounds like you have completely subject matter, and you seem to know so much about that. Um, I'm curious, as you went through the process of building the story, were there things that you were completely shocked about that you didn't know going into the start of making this film? Or is this stuff that you had already been aware of and it only just made made you feel like it was important to incorporate into the script? Well, I, I, I made a short film called Lost Girls, which is also about trafficking before this. It's a different story. So I'd, I already had somewhat of an education from doing that film. But one of the stories that really um, shocked me was was the story about a, tra uh, some, a group of traffickers that um, burnt one of their one of the girls working for them alive on Figueroa because they found out that she was going to testify, and that really shocked me. And it's a true story. The the, the um, Lieutenant Andre Dawson actually, who told me about it, sent me the newspaper clipping because it seems so horrendous that somebody could be burnt alive in broad daylight on Figueroa without kind of it being made a big deal of, um, that I, I, I almost couldn't believe it, but it, it happened and it only got very minimal coverage in a tiny little paper. And, 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 and I thought that was kind of tragic too. So a, a lot of the girls that are trafficked um, are girls that have in the foster youth system or have run away from home 
There are girls from regular families who are trafficked, as in my film. Um, but the majority of girls that are trafficked are usually from the foster system and um, runaways. And then I very, another very important thing teenagers to know is that 98% of runaway, uh, one, runaway girls are trafficked within 48 hours of arriving at their new destination. That statistic really shocked me. And it's an important one, I think, to make people aware of because it's so easy for a teenager to have had a spat with mom or dad or another sibling or whatever and decide, right, that's it. I'm going to here. And they don't really have a plan, but they just want to get out of where they are. And these traffickers literally have recruiters at bus stations, train stations, so they're kind of like ready for when these young vulnerable people arrive to recruit them, groom them and pick them up. And I think that's something that teenagers aren't aware of enough. And it's, it, you know, they'll, they'll run away from home all starry eyed with these big plans. And what actually ends up happening to them is absolutely tragic. I can hear the passion behind, you know, your voice when you're speaking about this. Obviously, you were moved enough to write a film and to um, bring it into fruition through it with a nonprofit organization to spread awareness about the subject. Um, I want to shift it to filmmaking, and I'm curious how you protected your young actors in this film. How did you deal with such um, heavy subject matter and let the young women that you were working with get to a very deep place um, in their acting in this film? Um, that, that's a great question, Monica, thank you. It, it's very important um, when you're dealing with young actresses and asking them to put themselves into this very dark place for these very challenging roles, to really, to really look after them emotionally. So when we were on set, you know, there was always like a lot of hugging, and I would always make sure after each, you know, after each take that the actress was okay. And and I had to be very sensitive to that. And all the the, the older actors. Olivia Darbo and Randall Batenkoff, too, who played the parents, were also very much, you know, very protected over Jane, the young girl who plays Auntie. And we, you know, we all, you know, particularly her, because she had the toughest scenes, like really looked after her and gave her lots of hugs and, and made sure that she was okay. And I, I think when you make a film like that, it, it's important not to make the set a dark, gloomy place. But to 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 laugh and to keep some light light around the darkness because we're telling a dark tale, we're telling a very important tale. But my goal is to make change with this film and do what I can before I leave this planet to try and make you know as much difference as I can um, in stopping child trafficking. But at the same time, as a filmmaker, I want to be very protective about the emotional health of the people that I'm working with. And as, as the director, you have to kind of set the tone for um, what type of atmosphere that was. So that was very important to me. It shows. I, I, I think the performances are just astounding. I think it was just an amazing accomplishment to have a, a goal specifically to, to make trafficking awareness kind of at the at the forefront but also to tell the story so beautifully and you really brought some incredible people together to tell the story um, i'm curious because you mentioned you had also a short film is the short film talk on subject matter that was different than lost girls or uh, is it also on trafficking specifically or is there a different angle that you went with the short film you're working on um, the, the short film 
Lost Girls, and it's available on Amazon and Amazon Prime, if anyone wants to see it. It is a slightly different angle. It's about the cycle of abuse, and it's about a young girl who traffics another young girl, and the difficulty she has, uh, she's basically kind of like trapped into a situation, and the difficulty she has with that, and how something that young girl does touches her, that gives her the courage to stand up finally to her traffickers and well I won't I won't I won't ruin the rest of the of the story but it's 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 a great little film it's a 25 minute um narrative short and it's with Marisol Nichols who is currently one of the leads in Riverdale and Bar Paley who's in an NCIS and um, some other wonderful actors and there's also a 15 minute educational piece about trafficking that accompanies it You were doing your searches for um, organizations to team up with. What made you choose Artists for Change? Um, and how was the collaboration with their mission and your like your focus for the film? Well, uh, funnily enough, I founded off Artists for Change after um, because uh, 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 I've always been a great believer in the power of media for change. So after I made the short film, and we had a lot of organizations use it for outreach and fundraising, and I gave it to whoever wanted to as a tool. And then I also got asked to speak at one of the World Bank kind of conference events at um, USC to a group of nonprofits from all over the world about film and show the lost girls and talk to them about how they could like make films using the techniques that I'd use to make Lost Girls around their particular issues. And in talking to everyone afterwards, I realized two things. One of, none of these nonprofits had any budget um, for uh, media. And secondly, nobody in the nonprofits had any narrative storytelling skills. So I saw a gap in the marketplace, and my goal when I founded Artists for Change, which I founded with Sean Acosta, who was one of the uh, producers of the short film with me, and Halil Sevis, was to um, makers to use their voices for change. And so, you no, know, I did. Um, film that you're going to see tonight on a kind of volunteer basis and um, it was a pretty big time commitment let me tell you so we felt that to get the first one out there um, I knew I was willing to put in that time commitment and to really kind of follow through on everything so we did that as a film through the non-profit and our hope is that other filmmakers will come to us with films on you know, various other issues or trafficking or the homeless crisis and we had to get behind some other 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 people's work as well and then our other mission is to um, encourage artists into using their voices for good so we, we we actively do that and we try and do educational events and and other things around it too Wonderful. Well, I think it's it's really amazing to see art as activism and getting to see the importance of storytelling and how powerful it can be. Um, I'm curious, as heavy as the subject matter is for the for the film, was there any sort of um, funny story from behind the scenes that might you might want to share? Just because I know it is such a dark subject matter to to have to tell. Was there things that um, maybe? you want a, a story to anecdote to share with us <laughs> um <clears throat> well there were there were there were always kind of like funny things that 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 that, that, that thing. and we did have like a we did also have like a lot of fun doing it uh but there was there was well, i had one of the, the a real cop who was playing one of the cops and uh I, he was in to do one of his scenes and so he was showing he was also helping with showing the two lead actors who were playing the detectives um, how to move and to, so we wanted to kind of keep it authentic so he was also a consultant as well so 
he was there in the morning and we were doing some scenes with them when they're when they're when they're uh, on their steakhouse and they're doing one of the busts. And then after lunch, we get to the bit where he's in one of the scenes. And I'm looking for him everywhere. And I, I'm going like, where is he? Everyone's like looking for him. And apparently there was some police emergency that came up. And so he just had to go. So I very quickly had to like reconsider the, uh, how I was going to shoot that whole scene and write him out of it. And... um do that so you know there's there's a good side about having a real cop in your movie uh, but there's also a negative side is if they get called to the duty it's going to be more important than your film very true <laughs> fair enough um so we do have a question from the audience and that is uh 25 years ago trafficking wasn't well known do you think uh the internet has contributed to the increase of trafficking um ab absolutely because it's what what's happened with the internet and 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 that's why i think we really need stronger laws put in in this area is that um traffickers can get into our homes you know they 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 have ways of getting onto um various social media platforms gaming platforms another and they contact kids that way and that that is one of the challenges is if you don't know who your your teenagers are talking to on the internet and that that's why i think it's really important that parents build trust with their teenagers so and and like educate them without really scaring them about it because you don't want people to be living in fear but so that way if they do get like a they will let you know about it and sometimes i think it can also be helpful to do a little bit of monitoring you know especially with the younger teenagers monitoring internet activities as well um julia do you what what does change look like for you? What does real change look like? So like after the movie's done, after people have a uh, consciousness about it, what are some of the things that they can do to see this happen less frequently? I mean, yes, educating your children, but is there legislation that can can happen or you know uh, Absolutely. I, I think I think we need stronger penalties for um, the, the people that, for both traffickers and also the people that are, that are paying for sex, men that are paying for sex with underage girls. It, it should not be allowed. And right now, a lot of the times, all they get is what's equivalent of a parking ticket, that they get a fine and they have to go to John's school. And the, 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 it should be, you know, people should be put in prison using minors. There should be huge fines because ultimately, if you cut off the demand, there is no need to supply. We also need to re-educate men that the trafficking of teenagers is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to have a teenage sex with a teenage girl. I think having a website where anyone who's been an offender and put their picture up there would be a big deterrent. That if, if it was made public what they were doing, people would, would not do it. Um, I think an important thing that everybody can do is, is to just keep a watch out. You know, if you see something that doesn't look right, like you, if you report it, never try and jump in and do anything yourself because you never know whether these people could be, the traffickers could be armed or not. But if you see a situation that looks like trafficking, and if anyone goes to our website, artist number four change.org, we have like, you know, the symptoms of trafficking on there, and we have some actions that, that, that people can do. Petition signed. Um, people just need to kind of start shouting about that shout, this is not acceptable. The more changes, is likely to happen and I, I and i also think that there, there have been some good changes 
a lot of the airlines have started to like educate their staff. American Airlines has been a a, a leader in this area um, of as to what to look out for as trafficking victims. Um, I think there's a lot more awareness uh, with the police and detectives now, and that somebody, a teenager, who gets involved is busted for trafficking is not a criminal but they are a victim and need to be treated with love and care a lot of the times what was happening before was that these kids were getting put in jail and or juvenile detention center and they've already been through enough trauma already i think it's important that um uh, put money in their budget to for ngos that work with survivors of trafficking. If somebody is lucky enough to be rescued from a trafficking situation, or if they manage to escape, now that's one of the aspects that we show in our film, is it, it can be, the journey to recovery can be very challenging because often the girls will get ongoing um, threats from the traffickers. They have a lot of pressure from a lot of people, from the police, um, from you know, parents of other kind of like victims who want their children found. And, and, it, and, and all, they're dealing with so much trauma, negotiating their way through all these different agendas can be very challenging and they need help and they need trauma recovery. So I, I think that a lot of this work is done by NGOs rather than the government and it for low-income families you know they need they need help with it so we need the ngos to be providing those services so it's an important part of the of the budget now how big is the <laughs> how big is the the trafficking circle like like the trafficking ring like how big are we talking are we talking you know, maybe a couple gangs in the state of California. Are we talking major? Like, how? What is? How big does that look? Well, unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry to say, but um, trafficking is now the number two activity in America. So okay. it is huge, and unfortunately, there's traffic tra trafficking as well. Um, as sex trafficking. Our film focuses primarily on child trafficking, but there's a number of different types of trafficking that go on, and, and they're all pretty horrendous. But it, with, with um, child trafficking, sometimes it can be gangs. Unfortunately, what's happened, a lot of the gangs that used to deal with, formerly deal with like drugs and guns, have realized what a lucrative business it is selling girls because you can sell a gun once but you can sell a girl a teenage girl thousands of times so they can make huge amounts of money from each girl that they procure so these girls are literally like commodities to them they are like you know meat slabs of meat in a butcher shop that they can sell but unlike a butcher shop where you sell the slab of meat once, they sell them time and time again. And it, 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 the, 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 the morale and, and the, to me, the horror of these like young girls being literally stuck in a room and being having to have sex with sometimes up to 50 men a day is just so horrific. And if you think what that must do to someone psychologically, it's really bad. And even now, I, I heard from um, uh, another individual I know who works in trafficking. He'd spoken to a, a, a friend of his um, who has an NGO and had been driving around out on the streets just to see what the situation was like out there. In, during the pandemic and if there was anyone out there because they normally go around and, and give leaflets and offer help to some of the girls on the street and apparently girls would be streets they look terrified and that, so now they're not even only risking 
their health and their lives, as well as being traffic, which is just horrendous. So just because we've got a pandemic doesn't mean that people's desires have stopped. Uh, we actually have a question from Denise. She was wanting to know what your biggest challenge in making this film and how did you overcome it? Oh, I think um, the, and, and is Denise going to jump on and join us? Yeah, that's... Um, the, the, I think one of the biggest challenges in, in making the film was, was just getting the funding to make it. And I'm so grateful to the many individuals who really came and, and supported us in this. Because and also and also all those people, all the people too on my crew and the cast who work for way under their normal rates to actually get this made. So I think that was really the biggest challenge. I think to turn her camera on, if you're able, Denise. I hope I did that right. Maybe not. Okay, maybe not. Sorry. We can keep working that out. Um, so I'm curious. I'm curious. As you have a uh, a nonprofit organization now, you're also a casting director and you're a filmmaker. How do you f negotiate that balance between all of your passion projects? Oh my God! I I I just end up. Um, I, well, I'm primarily a director and, and producer. You know, that's my my the you know the the day job my day job as it were, um, but you, with the non profit we're a volunteer run non profit, so you just have to jump in and do whatever needs to to be done, and I think I'm lucky in some ways that I don't have children, so I have time on my hands, and so I tend to put everything that I can into the non-profit work that I do, whether it be making this film or um, helping like make a, a, a promotional video for another non-profit to raise awareness on what they do. Because like these are my, are, are my kids. And I feel that all the young girls, like the, the, the girls who are, who are from difficult homes who don't have present parents, um, kids in the in the in the foster system that I want to do something from them so I want to dedicate my time into trying to create a better environment and a safer place for all of them um and do you in your nonprofit I just I'm curious, do you, like, I know you create content that with a meaning, are you also teaching them how to create this content? Like, do you work with them hands-on or? Um, well, not at the moment because of the okay. pandemic, but what, ah, one, of the, right. one of the projects that we, that we did last year, we worked with another young nonprofit um, called Kids in the Spotlight who work with foster youth. And I got a team of filmmakers and I Film and I, I went down to the um, Ridgeway Foundation, which was the foster facility that I was working with, um, a couple of times every month. And we were doing uh, working on the script with the foster and giving them some acting classes and helping them. Very cool. And then um, they wrote the script, they all acted on it in it, and we filmed it. The film worked out really well. It's a very powerful little film, and I'm very proud of it. And these kids were amazing. The story that they told was really heartfelt, and they were so passionate. And, and one of them was interested in directing, so I've been mentoring him and talked to him regularly. And he's been doing pretty well. He's now in a, a paid internship at a film company and, and really wants to be a filmmaker after that experience. I love that. Yeah, because it is so important. I mean, arts education saves lives. I fully believe that with every fiber of my being. And I think sometimes, especially in these kinds of situations with foster kids or, you know, kids that have been in juvie, you know, because of 
as we've talked about before, having have been trafficked or going through some kind of situation that they is completely out of their control. It's almost like you as a mentor become like a parent. It's like a positive role model of what an adult is supposed to be and what they haven't yet been exposed to. You know, someone who's supposed to love them and take care of them. Yeah. And I, and I, th I think, I think that's, I think it's very important at the moment with in various communities we all need to look out for kids that are struggling and maybe don't have um, present parents you know because they're going through their own personal struggles and and be there for those kids because everybody needs someone and I think the more we can all work together within the communities that we're in and keep an eye out for all of the youth and always be there with like encouraging words and and to kind of like help them lift up and let them know that we're available if they ever need help. You know, there's people to adults to come to um, and talk to and, and 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 do what we can to make them feel supported. I think that's very important too. Well, so thanks. what's next on the horizon for you, Julia? Oh what's my God. Um, well, we're thinking about what we're going to do next with profit after the pandemic. I have a, do have another project on trafficking. I've also got a very cute comedy about a young girl and a dancing um, to do something totally, totally, totally different too. But it, you know, that even that has a theme. It's, it's about challenge over adversity because I, I, like to try and do films that have like an inspirational aspect and for those of you that haven't seen the film tonight I don't I don't want to say too much but there is some hope in it because we see what kind of like how much courage Angie has in conquering her demons and finding finding faith again and one of the things that I noticed in a lot of the survivor um, conferences that I went to and talking to a lot of the survivors is that church groups and faith play a big part in um, recovery with people from trauma. They very much were like rally round and, and, and support. And I, I think that there's a lot to be with working for, other, for others. A lot of the people that I met um, running non-profits fighting against trafficking were um, survivors of trafficking, and so they were used. They were helping other like girls who would just been rescued or had escaped to recover by using their experience, strength, and hope. And and I think when people are suffering from any type of trauma, whether it's PSD or, or a sexual trauma or whatever it is, there's so much that can be done with people that have recovered from those types of traumas, working with others and sharing their experience, strength. And I was wanting to know if you have, uh, how can people find you and support you in your work? If there's any um, links and socials anywhere, if you want to share them, we'd love to be able to share them with our people too. Sure. Um, you can find me at Julia Verdon, it's my name, J U L I A, B for Victory, E R D I N, on social media. And you can find our nonprofit at AFC, Artists for Change, AFC underscore LA, or go to the website at artist number four change.org. And you know, just ask everyone to do what they can to to help us end trafficking that would if we can do something to make a change there and really protect the um innocence of our youth that would be really amazing well thank, thank you. you so much for taking the time to talk to us about such serious subject matter and i think this is one of the core reasons why we believe in this festival so much um, because we really believe in uh, elevating content like this, you know, taking taking it and making it accessible to everyone. So thank you so much.
for coming out and doing this. Well, thank you, um, Monica and Adam, so much for giving this film an opportunity to be seen and and for being artists for change. And, and you've got like a wonderful selection of films but, and a lot of the other ones too will have social impact. So thank you so much for doing what you're doing too. Of course. Thank you. It's a great festival and, and you're wonderful to deal with. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Denise, thank you, Denise. Um, <laughs> your film starts at in 20 minutes. So if you want to head to theater one, you get to catch the next screening of Lost <laughs> Envy, Lost Girls. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, guys. And yeah, please join us over there. Absolutely. Thank you.